the goal of this session is to talk about translational opportunities uh, by walking through some specific examples. And so the format's gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna give a short talk, and I'm gonna ask our panelists to actually give short five-minute talks, and then we're all gonna have a discussion about these. Now, everybody in this group is a clinical entrepreneur, a business entrepreneur, but nobody has the title of being an evolution biologist. We're all just out in the field doing our work, but in many ways, uh, they touch on a lot of the evolutionary theory and principles that have been discussed so far. Uh, so I thought it'd be useful to just walk through how an amateur like myself can listen to what I hear and put it into practice. I actually was exposed to evolutionary theory in high school. I used to read a column called This View of Life by Stephen Jay Gould. It's written in uh, Smithsonian Magazine, I believe. And when I got to Harvard, I knocked on his door, wanted to learn more, ended up knocking on E.O. Wilson's door, ended up spending a year with him, um, went over to England, knocked on William Hamilton's door, Irv Shagnon in Santa Barbara, Tubi and Cosme days when they were transitioning from Stanford to Santa Barbara, and I eventually went to medical school. So I went to the medical school with their incredible notions in mind. Also Robert Trevor, some of the uh, work done on social evolution, parental, parental investment. And as I was thinking about these things, all the ideas, and including people that have long passed who developed the field. I don't know how many people know that Darwin was actually in medical school. Do people realize that? In fact, his father and grandfather were both doctors. And Darwin loved medicine, but he loved evolution even more, so he dropped out of medical school. And imagine what would have happened if he actually stayed in medical school. We might have had this conference uh, more than 100 years ago. And as I was reading through what happened after Darwin in terms of the medical component, um, a gentleman by the name of August Weissman first started to think about, wait, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for human evolution? What does it mean for health? What does it mean for aging? And he proposed this notion of program death. Is death an adaptation? Now, that's a fascinating concept. Um, and there are people who stand on both sides of this notion. Um, there are evidence supporting or refuting both of these ideas. Is death an adaptation? Is death programmed? Now, uh, I soon learned that, in fact, Weissman himself disavowed the idea uh, under the grounds that uh, if it, it's a mechanism that is programmed, there ought to be a single mechanism by which we age, and he couldn't find any, so he abandoned the idea himself. Um, but that's where I stopped. Rather than getting stuck in the debate, I just wondered, well, what if death is programmed? What would that mean? Well, first of all, if you look at the ontogeny of death in biologic evolution, in the earliest forms of life, uh, death didn't really exist. Programmed cell death, it is thought, uh, actually emerged sometime during the Cambrian era. In fact, if you're a bacteria in the olden days, uh, you didn't really have biologic death. You had ontoward death through other sorts of biotic and abiotic stresses from the outside world, but you generally divided and moved on. And at some time during the Cambrian era, it is thought that programmed cell death really emerged. All of a sudden, all sorts of life forms emerged. Things got competitive, things got very dense, uh, and certainly by the time of evolution of biofilms, programmed cell death was actually ubiquitous. So you could argue, it, well, is death actually an innovation to contend with resource constraint, innovation, and so forth. The second implication is, and we just talked about what cancer is doing wrong and how it's doing its harm, um, but what's interesting about cancer, as is pointed out during the talks, is that, in fact, a cancer is a cell that's programmed to die. All of our cells are programmed to die in our bodies. And it shuffles a few things, and now it's immortal. Uh, that's a fascinating observation. Uh, and maybe we should be thinking about not what cancer, what is cancer doing wrong? What is cancer doing right? Uh, so somehow it's able to take from its inventory of adaptations and traits and processes and somehow reinvent biologic immortality. In fact, it's so hard to kill these things. Um, but then I was stuck with, this, stuck with this notion of, wow, but if, in fact, death is programmed, what's the mechanism? What is the program? Because if you can find the program, now we have the opportunity to reprogram it, which is a little more elegant than how we do medicine today, which is a game of whack-a-mole. It's very expensive. It's very 
inefficient and ultimately it's ineffective, we all die. Um, so what if there's an end around uh, the entire structure of disease and aging and medicine? Can we program death away? So as it turns out, there's some possibilities, things that are systemic that impact all the disease of aging, the common ground. Uh, for instance, until you hit the age of 10, you know, if you have a wound, you can restore the original organ, but after 12, things undergo the path of fibrosis. So imagine, as we get older, every one of our micro injuries leads to fibrosis instead of restoration, and so the accumulation of all that damage. This is the, uh, the failure to repair hypothesis of aging. So that, that makes sense. That's one plausible uh, path we can go. Uh, another is this notion of autonomic dysfunction. Now, this is a, um, an interesting field because autonomic dysfunction has been studied for over 100 years, but it's only now really gaining in prominence. prominence. Uh, and the basic narrative goes like this. Uh, we know that the most common driver of natural selection is predation. It was mentioned uh, earlier, I think it was in Andrew's talk. Um, actually, no, it, was, it was discussed last night uh, over over dinner, the idea that in, in the wild, the most common cause of death is getting eaten, because every day in nature, you're either the prey or the predator, that's pretty much all that ever happens to you. And we've uh, inherited this incredible uh, system to contend with ongoing predator-prey interactions. It's called a fight-or-fight system. So when you're facing a lion, we saw a, a kitty up there earlier, um, what is your body gonna do? It's gonna mount a fight-or-flight response, through your autonomic nervous system, and its job is to make you more alert, raise your blood pressure, turn on your immune system because you're about to get violated, shut down all your long-term projects like digestion and reproduction so you can allocate resources to your brain, your muscles, find that hole and run through it. Your body's gonna be flooded with sugars. Now, if you reclassify the disease of aging, it looks like the chronic activation of the fight or flight response. Being alert all the time is called insomnia, if it's over alert, it's called epilepsy. Your blood pressure being up all the time is called hypertension. Immune system being turned on all the time is called inflammation. Uh, digestion being suppressed all the time, constipation. If, uh, reproduction being shut down all the time is infertility. In men, we call it erectile dysfunction. And flooding your body with sugars all the time is called diabetes. So if you actually look at the physiologic measures of people as they incur these diseases, they're all in sympathetic dysfunction. They, there's a very simple measure called heart rate variability. And, it, and everyone, it goes up with age, and then the heart, heart rate really goes down. Down is bad, so the dysfunction increases with age. And in every case, the specific disease is also associated with the sympathetic bias of that organ. Um, now, is this predictive? Um, hair loss is thought to be your mother's dad's genes, but if you actually look at what a cat does, if you were to scare the cat, the cat's gonna release his hair uh, because it's an escape instinct away from the, to get away from the predator's claws. Now, if it's turned on chronically, it might look like baldness. Uh, so automatic dysfunction may be one of the Occam's razor on thinking about all the disease of aging. What look like disparate conditions may actually be one disease that just manifests differently. This is not uncommon in nature. Cellular automata, uh, Occam's razor, uh, again, the simplest explanation may be the best way to look at these things. Um, if you also look at the, the symptom study, despite the fact that we have all these named diseases, uh, if you look at the symptoms that characterize all disease, it's basically everything's gonna manifest as a headache, a fever, pain, nausea, vomiting. There's only a few things that ever happen, and those are all driven by the autonomic nervous system, typically by the vagal system. Um, so this led to a thought, maybe we should be looking at reprogramming the autonomic nervous system as a way, way to treat broadly all the diseases of aging. Because here we are, the system is getting deprogrammed as we age, and can we reprogram it? So we looked to a company called Cyberonics, which harnesses the vagus nerve, which is one of the oldest nerves in your body. It's a large truncal nerve right here in the neck. And could you restore vagal function as to normalize your sympathetic vagal balance and essentially reverse all the disease of aging? Now, the company was already doing some work in epilepsy, uh, but looking at it as a platform technology, it looked like a very interesting investment uh, as they go through and tackle one disease of aging after another. So with that, I would like to invite our first speaker, Larry, are you, okay. Please come on in and please introduce yourself, your work. He actually works at Proteus Biomedical, but is a consultant for Cybronics. And uh, he's been thinking a lot about these ideas as well. So Larry. Thank you, Jim.
Hi. Um, my, my background's a little diverse. I, um, I'm a cardiologist. Um, I've practiced in the past. Um, I also worked in bioengineering device-based platforms for uh, the management of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, I've also developed drugs uh, with Pfizer. I developed both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular drugs for many years, both in early and late stage development. As I thought a little bit about today, um, I thought I'd bring three examples that for me really speak in an encouraging way about how medicine really is evolving and how the aspects of evolution that have been discussed today are really being utilized at this point for actually trying to treat diseases and making some success in doing that. Okay, so uh, my three examples are uh, one of modulating gene expression, uh, a second uh, mimicking genetic malformation for the better, and finally bringing the humors into balance. So with regard to modulating gene expression, uh, one of the most interesting uh, group of drugs that I uh, encountered uh, when I first got involved in drug development were the so-called PPAR agonists. Uh, PPAR is a very long-winded term, proliferating peroxisome activator receptors. Uh, their role, basically, is to modulate gene expression. Uh, and so these are... These are um, proteins within the cell itself, this is the outer cell membrane, and drugs have been developed uh, for purposes of actually agonizing or encouraging the, use, the activation of these proteins with regard to their targets uh, for gene expression. And so uh, these are nuclear receptor proteins that regulate expression of genes. There are actually targets of marketed drugs. Uh, some are called glitazones, other ones called fibrates, uh, to treat both diabetes and hyperlipidemia. Uh, and there's actually interest in reaching more than one target uh, with a single drug to treat the so-called metabolic syndrome. This is a constellation of problems, aggregate of problems, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, all occurring in the same individual. Uh, and so this is one area uh, where there's certainly a lot of risk. One is going into the hall of the mountain king. One is actually thinking about modulating gene expression. There can be good and there can be bad that can happen here. Uh, but there have been some encouraging cases where good has occurred and not too much bad, and hopefully uh, this may provide at least some window of understanding for future development. Uh, another encouraging area is mimicking genetic malformation. Uh, in 1996, there were three important observations with regard to HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus that leads to AIDS. Uh, these were that HIV binds to a specific receptor called CCR5. Uh, it's whoop, it's uh, that little squiggle right there. Uh, and so uh, the HIV virus looks to bind at this area and ultimately is able to enter the cell. That entry is very important. Once an HIV or the HIV virus can enter a cell, it's using the machinery within that cell to multiply very rapidly. This is how the virus basically spreads, quote unquote, its infection. This is where all the work is done. The key is getting into the cell. There was a model created based upon the understanding that not only did HIV bond to that specific receptor, but 1% of Euro Europeans actually lack the gene for CCR5. And so they become resistant to HIV. Even though they have the HIV within them, they are not getting infected. And untreated, they don't progress to AIDS. They're walking around with the virus the way that many of us may have a positive skin test. Those amongst the physicians in the, um, in the audience, I'm sure more than one of us has a positive skin test for tuberculosis. Uh, but we live in happy coexistence. We don't get tuberculosis. We have evidence that we have the colonization, but not the infection. And this is the case with these individuals. Uh, from those observations, work was done to actually model a drug configuration that would be needed to actually deform the CCR5. If you, if you deform it, uh, there's going to be no action with regard to the virus entering. And from that, a molecular library search was used with rapid computerized screening of about 10,000 molecules and identified one. It has a, a number and a name, UK427857. And this was the candidate for the intended mode of action. Let's deform the receptor. That'll help prevent the HIV from entering. 
Uh, and the idea was to get to that CCR5 uh, receptor with the desired effect and acceptable safety. Um, over several years, uh, the candidate, which is up here in the upper left-hand corner, gradually was modified until the actual drug that seemed like it would do the work that was intended formed. Uh, we're not going to spend any time on all of these. Uh, however, one thing that's really interesting is uh, they have something in common. They all have rings. They all have some kind of side chain. And you notice that between the beginning and the end, the side chains have become more complex. And one of the rings has become almost like a Venus flytrap. Um, through trial and error, uh, first creating the molecule, then doing some additional benchtop testing, it was also ultimately determined that yes, this one in the right lower hand corner was probably the one that was going to be the one that was most effective. There followed then some human testing that established and proved the hypothesis. And those human tests are very interesting because these were conducted in patients that were already receiving accepted triple therapy for HIV infection, but who were not responding. Uh, and the breakthrough resulted in the um, treatment that you see. Finally, uh, June referred to uh, stimulating the vagus, the parasympathetic system. Our forefathers said that we have um, bad vapors, bad humors. They need to be in balance. Uh, when they're unbalanced, we get fight or flight. Protective effects would be to bring the parasympathetic system back into play. Uh, this has been done successfully for epilepsy and depression. There are some patients with heart failure who be appear to be re uh, responding. Uh, we'll ask you to stay tuned uh, because there may be some good things that follow from here. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And just to expand on that further, I uh, wish we had a couple more minutes to discuss heart failure and your sympathetic nervous system. Essentially, uh, one of the most common ways that we die if we don't die of these diseases of aging is we have these acute events. Uh, in medicine, we call it acute coronary syndrome. Colloquially, it's known as heart attack. And when, when you observe a patient having a heart attack, their vessels are tight, they're inflaming, they're coagulating, which is completely counterproductive and then further stems the blood flow from going to where it needs to. So it's almost like a dysfunctional cycle. And if you think about why that's happening, the most common cause of death, again, in nature was predatory violation of your skin and the idea of reacting to injury by coagulating, inflaming, and vasoconstricting made sense. But in the modern life, where the source of injury is not a lion's tooth, it's actually hypertension or smoking, some other source of injury. Now we respond to the same, uh, to a different trigger with the same factory setting, which is we inflame, coagulate, and vasoconstrict. And in this case, it's life-threatening. So that's essentially what heart disease is, or acute heart attack is. If you survive a heart attack, you end up with something called congestive heart failure, which itself is a very interesting condition. Congestive heart failure, your, your kidneys don't see enough blood coming down, and unfortunately, it hoards water, which is counterproductive, because in a congestive heart failure, your pump's no longer doing this, it's very weak, blood flip, blood's not flowing, your kidneys aren't feeling enough blood, so it retains more water, which stretches the heart and makes it weaker. Uh, so the, what the body is essentially doing, what the maladaptation there is, in nature, the only time you are not seeing enough blood to go to your kidneys is when you're exsanguinating the field because your leg's bitten off. So the idea of retaining water is adaptive. In the modern world, when pump dysfunction is the reason you don't get enough blood to your kidneys, hoarding water is maladaptive. So if you look at somebody in congestive heart failure, their adrenaline's high, cortisol's high, their massive sympathetic crisis, and their heart rate variability is low. And this is what cybernetics is addressing. Uh, I want to now introduce three other speakers. I'm sorry. Uh, it'll be two other speakers that relate to uh, this idea of trait induction. And um, I might as well also bring up Ray Anders for that. So I'll bring up all three speakers under this umbrella called trait induction. One of the things that's happening is uh, we are learning that more and more of the disease that we are incurring are really maladaptations of our core responses that we inherited. So if that's the case, if many diseases are maladaptations, then maybe medicine should be the induction of adaptations. Uh, what normally happens is when you're maladaptive, it takes evolution many cycles. It could be days, it could be millions of years in order to induce those traits. But what if we, as a medical community, a scientific community, could actually provide the force that evolution would otherwise provide and actually induce the trait somatically, as we heard from Carlos talk. Could we induce the trait somatically as a way to treat patients? 
So what this would mean is, if you look at, it's almost doing the opposite of what we're doing today. The, the vast majority of modern therapies, we give you the drug to fix your problem, but your body de-adapts. So if you drink caffeine every day, you actually become more tired of it, more tired without it. Your background, your baseline gets much more tired. If you take a sleeping pill every day, you can sleep great when you take the drug, but in fact, over time, you become more and more alert. If you take a pain med every day, you become more sensitized to pain. If you take Prozac every day, you end up with something called serotonin withdrawal syndrome. You end up with these rebound flares of depression. Uh, so if you go across medicine, we're essentially inducing decompensation. It's also known as tachyphylaxis. And what ends up happening is over time, you end up with on more and more meds, and you haven't really solved the problem. And when you stop taking the drug, you are perhaps more vulnerable than ever because you're more de-adapted. So what would nature do? In nature, the way which we would treat high blood pressure, which we currently treat in medicine by lowering your blood pressure, and your blood pressure starts rising as a compensatory response in the background. Uh, in, in nature, we exercise, we raise our blood pressure, we raise our heart rate, and as a compensatory response, our, not, our, our baseline blood pressure and heart rate go down. It's very interesting. So exercise is, a, is the original uh, trait induction mechanism. Now, could you apply this to uh, the development of therapies. Uh, now, this notion was uh, not a very popular one when you talk to physicians about it, because remember, we all swore through the Hippocratic Oath first to no harm, and that position is defended by lawyers if you actually try to do it. Um, but the idea really uh, resonated with Sir James Black, who was a Nobel laureate, um, who was actually the first person to call on this idea and said, you know what, that's really interesting. He was the person who developed beta blockers the very first hypertension drug that was invented. And he connected me with Dr. Richard Bond, who is going to be our next speaker. And I'll describe sort of how that meeting went. Dr. Bond was doing some very innovative work that was essentially the induction of an adaptation chronically rather than treating the disease acutely. And it was something that was so provocative. And he was actually inducing the trait. Essentially, in asthma, your lungs collapse uh, inappropriately, and you're not able to breathe, and he's actually giving the exact drug that's contraindicated for asthma acutely, but he gives a chronic all the time as a way to induce your body to open up the lungs more. So without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Richard Bond, University of Houston. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. I want to go back to the theme that was introduced early by you about that we become very close-minded at an early age. Okay, so a few quotes. Almost always the men who achieve these fundamental inventions of a new paradigm have been either very young or very new to the field whose paradigm they challenge. A very annoying quote for anybody over 30, right? Nothing, you're gonna do nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was written in the 50s. That's why it says men. Uh, the next one's from the person we were talking about. I find it interesting that many of our great revolutionary scientists, such as Newton, Ma Darwin, Mendel, Einstein, and Faraday, were inappropriately trained. They had no intellectual baggage to shed. Another Nobel laureate, Arvid Carlson, said, in this regard, I and my collaborators simply had the advantage of being ignorant and not so much burdened by dogma. And finally, all wisdom is plagiarism, only stupidity is original. Uh, so, all of those say there's something very good about being naive, and we've tried to keep this theme going, and I'm going to take you through an exercise like Jung did that hopefully will, will show this. So, add one symbol and make the following equal to seven, and you can all do that. Add two symbols and keep this equal to nine, and, and this gets harder, but if I gave you enough time, you would realize you could divide by one. Now, add one symbol and make the following equal to six. And this gets really, really, really hard. And yet, look, <laughs> so if we went to a 10-year-old child and said, add something to IX, right? So two things went wrong, knowledge of the Roman numeral, but worse, success with the Roman numeral system. And if you weren't thinking in English, you still have no excuse. There's always more than one way to do something. <laughs> so here's, here's the, what Jung was talking about. So in the disease called congestive heart failure, which is on the increase because you have a heart attack and you survive the heart attack now, uh, your body secretes adrenaline to try and get your increased cardiac output. And we treated it with drugs like dobutamine, with, which are beta adrenoceptor agonists or stimulants, and they worked. People felt better, they walked longer, their quality of life was improved. The problem was 
they died sooner. Okay, so these, these drugs were acutely beneficial, chronically detrimental, and at the same time, we contraindicated, absolutely contraindicated beta blockers, because those are the receptors on your heart that adrenaline is working through to increase cardiac output and contractility. So when you get a, someone with heart failure a beta blocker, they get worse. But a Swedish resident put a woman with heart failure on it, and she got worse, but he left her on it, and eventually she got better. And now beta blockers, certain beta blockers, it's not all of them, are the best drugs we've ever had at decreasing mortality in the disease of heart failure. So here, the, this is fascinated me because the medical community had it not a little bit wrong. We had it completely backwards, okay? We not only killed a few dozen here, but we let millions and millions of people die prematurely by keeping them away from the drug that was uh, the most beneficial. Now, at one point, I started to, to see why uh, beta blockers worked in heart failure, and then on March 4, 2000, I decided to change the question, and I, I wanted to know, if, are we making the same mistake again? So if you, if you want to ask that question, you can come to asthma rather quickly, which if any of you have asthma in your purse or pocket, you've got albuterol, a beta adrenoceptor agonist. Uh, however, when given chronically on a constant basis, GSK ran the trial and it was stopped for an increase in mortality. So uh, similar to here, although the evidence here is not as clear, the agonists were acutely beneficial, chronically detrimental. We contraindicated beta blockers and this was a box left on, uh, that wasn't filled in and I tried to fill that in. Here is a mouse model of asthma, the, the yellow bars. The y-axis is airway resistance. The x-axis is a bronchoconstrictor, okay? So the, the, this drug makes the airways close. And normal mice respond to this with an increase in airway resistance, but the asthmatic mice hyper responds. So this is a symptom of asthma, airway hyper responsiveness. And if you give them one dose of a beta agonist, salbutamol or albuterol. Salbutamol is just the English version. Uh, airway resistance comes down. And if you give them a dose of a beta blocker, natalol, airway, they, they get worse. So look, at, I had to change the scale from six to 10. This is actually the same curve as that. So based on this paradigm, which is a single dose paradigm, we decided we're gonna treat asthma with this and contraindicate this. Now, I'm gonna hold all the parameters the same, but instead of giving one dose, I'm gonna give 28 days of treatment. And this is what happens. This stops working, and this becomes the best drug you ever had. Okay, so just like in heart failure, you have an acutely detrimental and a chronically beneficial effect. And I'm just gonna give you one more readout, which is also common to asthma, and this is something called mucous metaplasia. Now you're looking down the airway of a mouse, and this is a normal mouse, and this is the epithelial lining. When we give them asthma, th these cells undergo something called mucous metaplasia, and they become filled with mucus. They're called goblet cells. This is 28 days of treatment with what's in your purse, and this is 28 days of treatment with a beta blocker. So uh, we can acutely make the, the, the condition worse and force some kind of compensation, and we're, we're now trying to work on the mechanism. But uh, that's, that's it for me, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. In a completely unrelated field of food allergies, which is arguably uh, one of, if not the most fast-growing clinical illness that we face today, uh, I want to introduce Dr. Carrie Nodo, who is actually giving the food that kids are allergic to as a way to induce the trait of tolerance in these kids. So Dr. Nadeau is from Stanford here, and without further ado, let me bring you up to stage. Thank you. Thanks. I, um, I thought I would mostly talk uh, to the audience, since this is such a critical problem. And what I'll briefly talk about in the next five minutes is, number one, the problem. And then number two, is this an evolutionary 
fit type adaption or evolutionarily maladaptive in terms of having allergies in the first place, specifically food allergies, which are life-threatening. And then thirdly, what therapy are we giving? And how is that consistent with some of the messages that June has given, which is we are actually um, finding that in our data set that we are somatically inducing a trait. And that trait is actually adaptive in a positive way towards a non-allergic state. And whether or not that trait will then be inherited and move forward in progeny is a question we have to ask. But I think what's so fascinating about this field is, number one, it's moving quickly. We need to find therapies. But through the analysis of how those therapies work, we're actually trying to get to a broader idea, which is how these traits are going to be somatically modified and then hopefully decrease the likelihood of allergies being inherited. So um, what's the problem? So probably there are those of you in this audience who have allergies. 30% of all people, children or adults alike, have some form of allergies, either allergic rhinitis, allergic conjunctivitis, asthma, or food allergies. 8% of all children less than the age of 18 have food allergies. And that means a doctor's diagnosis of food allergies, which could be, in 50% of those cases, resulting in a life-threatening reaction at some point in their lives. So what we're talking about, and the CDC just put these statistics out in 2009, as well as a paper was just published last year in pediatrics. We're talking about a cost of about $31 billion a year for allergy medical care, which includes trips to the emergency room, which includes walking down the aisle of Walgreens, and there are now two aisles in your average pharmaceutical uh, drug uh, store that are just allocated to allergies and medications. So we know this problem is not going to go away. Now, to talk about how we're going to try to understand and study this problem. So from an evolutionary standpoint, there was a pa paper just published two weeks ago in Nature where we're trying to understand why allergy became apparent in evolution. If you actually think of the first organism that um, has cells that were uh, determined to be pro-allergic cells, it's actually the sea cucumber. So these cells that respond uh, in an allergic inflammatory capacity have been there in uh, very uh, simple organisms within the evolution of this planet. Why? We still don't understand that. So this paper that was published in Nature actually uh, hypothesizes that somehow people with allergies have protection and that that protection enables them to possibly uh, have protection against, let's say, venoms or let's say uh, sun stroke, but no one's actually proven that. And so I just leave that hanging out there because those hypotheses and that type of paradigm shift needs to be tested. For most of us in this room and for any of you who actually have allergies and specifically food allergies or drug allergies, one would assume that that is a maladaptive measure, that having allergies and having the potential of dying within six minutes is actually maladaptive. And I think what's very worrisome to me in this field is that if you have a parent with an allergic symptom or some type of constellation of clinical symptoms, their child has a 65% chance of having allergies, and that allergy will be more severe. And that will either result in their going to the emergency room or having a near fatal reaction. If you have two parents with allergies, either asthma or allergic rhinitis, that child has an 85% chance of having allergies, and that allergy will be more severe. So when you look at the doubling time within our population, within 20 years, the allergy rate is doubling in the United States. And so this was published in the New England Journal uh, about 10 years ago, and the CDC just put out its recent statistics in 2009. So this is really interesting from a genetics capacity to understand how can we stop this seemingly evolutionary trait moving forward as we move forward in our uh, generations. And so that comes through some of the interesting questions that June posited, which is, can we actually develop a therapy which changes the somatic trait towards an anti-allergic trait? And so the way that I studied that question was, number one, we looked at twins. And we looked at monozygotic twins that were discordant for life-threatening allergy. For example, you take, life uh, you take monozygotic twins that are ob obviously identical, and then you look at what epigenetic changes occurred in the genes 
the, of the individual that has no allergies compared to the individual that actually does have the food allergies. And when we looked at that, we saw certain candidate genes that were modified epigenetically in the subjects that did not have food allergy and that were protected. So then, to move on, we then looked at the patients that had undergone this very special therapy at Stanford, where it's very natural. You give back the same allergen to the patient over time, and you increase it ever so slightly in a safe format so that eventually they will be able to eat that serving's worth of food, but it takes about two or three years. So when we're doing that, we're obviously also looking at epigenetic modifications in these same key loci that we found in the monozygotic twins, and indeed those same candidate genes are being changed over time. And so now, at the end of the two years of the study, those subjects that have gotten success in their therapy and now can actually eat the very same foods that they were previously having life-threatening reactions to, those epigenetic marks are being changed. And now we need to study whether or not those are sustained and whether or not those can be inherited in their progeny. And so what I'll leave you with today is the interesting question as to whether or not through therapy, and in the, my particular case, is a very natural form of the therapy, albeit um, you have to be very careful about it. Uh, by, by having this therapy given to patients at different ages, we're showing that these epigenetic changes occur, and they're consistent with a non-allergic state. And so this is very exciting for us to possibly think about somatic induction of traits that are actually adaptive evolutionarily, and we'll have to see whether or not these are sustained and then move forward in the next generation. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Kari. And of course, vaccines are probably the earliest example of trait induction, uh, arguably one of the greatest inventions in medical history. And it took, uh, at the time, about seven decades for vaccination to become standard care and medical practice. Uh, we heard from two pharmaceutical, exam two pharmaceutical examples of trade induction. Uh, I'm now gonna ask Dr. Ray Anders, surgeon from Case Western, uh, who's gonna give an example from the medical device side. Well, thanks. Um, evolutionary, surgeons are the lowest evolved in the medical world. Evolutionary, I'm one of 10 children, so I knew that we're all waiting for that food, and the only way I survived was to be the first one to run out there, so I'll make this very brief. Um, mechanical ventilation is life savings. It developed during the polio epidemics to keep people alive. Mechanical ventilation is now one of the highest cost things in the United States. Mechanical ventilation is positive pressure ventilation. We evolved for our chest, our heart, our lungs to work with negative pressure ventilation. We developed over the last 17 years a way to go from positive pressure ventilation using our own muscles, our own diaphragm with electrical stimulation. When you're on a ventilator, such as a spinal cord injury, uh, my second research patient ever was Christopher Reeve, Superman, who jumped on board a ship because he said, what else do I have to lose? I'm a quadriplegic on a ventilator. To looking at getting them off the ventilator, to delaying a programmed cell death in ALS. We just received FDA approval for our second device. Uh, to delay death in patients with Lou Gehrig's disease, where they have a programmed cell death and they all die from respiratory failure. We can change the diaphragm physiology of maintaining type 1 muscle fiber. As I look out in the audience, nobody's using accessory muscles to breathe, so you all have about 70% of your diaphragm is type 1 slow twitch muscle fiber. With disuse, because our diaphragm evolved to work every minute of every day, within 12 hours of being on mechanical ventilation, you have expression to about 100% type 2B muscle fiber and atrophy faster than any other muscle fiber. So everything that we do in our intensive care units is actually, you know, they keep the people alive, we put them on a ventilator, but we're actually causing significant problems, causing atrophy and conversion to type 2B muscle fiber Perhaps a simple thing such as diaphragm pacing, a little electrode we put on the diaphragm muscle can maintain that muscle mass, prevent the ventilator-associated pneumonia so we don't have to develop all these new antibiotics by getting rid of posterior lobe atelectasis. So perhaps by going back to more natural breathing, we can help solve one of the big expensive aspects of intensive care units. The life-saving effect of mechanical ventilation actually causes significant diaphragm dysfunction that leads to many other problems. So that's short. Introduction, June. I hopefully that'll uh, close your session here. Thanks.